हेलो डॉक्टर बैनर्जी हेलो प्लीज अनम्यूट योर सेल्फ कैन यू हियर मी नाउ यस 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 मैम यस मैम ओके कैन यू we will uh, start the program in 2 to 3 minutes ma'am and then you kindly uh, keep your video on my video is on but it is saying that you can't start video because the host has stopped it so no no the, uh, this is because because the screen is being shared hmm. by the powerpoint okay. uh, of the speaker that's why they are showing it otherwise you see that you are a co-host probably it is being given that you are a co-host and it is co-host so okay. co-host can on it but since it is shared since the ppt is shared we cannot share a I mean none of us can share the video when okay, i then stop it you can share in 2 to 3 minute ma'am we will be starting uh, you will be starting then after that you tell me when to share okay, start my okay. powerpoint i'll start it at that okay, time okay 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 thank you just a second okay yeah 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 you can see me isn't it okay okay thank you you are papia you are papia okay 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 thank you thank you এর প্রেজেন্টেশনটা অন করে দিই তাহলে না একজন অলরেডি করছে আই ক্যান শেয়ার অন দি হোস্ট অল প্যানেলিস্ট ইউ ক্যান স্টার্ট শেয়ারিং ইন সামওয়ান এলস ইজ শেয়ারিং আচ্ছা যখন শেয়ার করতে বলবো এখন টাইম বলবো Good afternoon, ma'am. Yeah, hi. Oh, hi. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's uh, one thirty there. Yeah, yeah. It's twelve thirty. Twelve thirty. Yeah. Okay, it's twelve thirty. Yeah, three and a yeah. half hours. Okay. Ajay, will I be able to see the participants? Ma'am, you won't be able to see the participant. You can only uh, be able to see their uh, numbers. Acha, acha. Okay. Ninety-six participants are there. You see in your box, and if you click on the participant, you will get their name. Okay. And if okay. you want to talk to them, they will send some question and answer, and they will raise their hand. In Zoom, everybody is muted. Okay. Okay. Everyone okay. is muted. Whenever somebody will raise their hand, we will. Uh, allow them to talk and then you can only hear them okay you okay. cannot view them because their video is uh, being kept off okay, okay and they okay. can put their question answer and from there you can interact with them 
so we have a 103 participant out of them if you click you see we are six panelists okay and attendance are 96 we are just uh, informally i want to inform you that we have 200 participants per day 200 okay that's students good. in zoom that's good ma'am okay. and 30 students are in youtube live because okay. everybody are not using zoom so total approximately 230 students and this is the eighth day so mm -hmm. that's why we are waiting a little Okay. Uh, they will uh, surely join within five join. minutes because you know due to network problems. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think. I okay, ma'am. Another thing, no, another thing I wanted to ask: Is it the language of communication? Is it completely English, or uh, there are students who will be more comfortable in Bengali? Ma'am, you can use many both, both language, languages both language. because okay. all the students can understand Bengali. Okay. So they are uh, no, no, I mean, equally comfortable. Yeah, no, what I meant so to say is that... This will be a better thing because text, it will yeah, be... Yeah, uh, yeah. Because there may be some who are not comfortable exactly. in the colloquial English, but they know the scientific uh, language. Exactly, ma'am. Uh, right, so, you are. Exactly. So, I mean, where they get stuck, I can always... They can ask me in Bengali also. <laughs> yes. Fine. Yes. Okay. Yes. I'll be okay with it. Okay. It's good we met. I never met you before. At yeah. least we are meeting <laughs> over soon. <laughs> Shuja is also there in another desktop, but in okay. our desktop, that is the old model and uh, mm -hmm. still no webcam over there. So you can hear, I, may I uh, request Dr. Ghosh to unmute yourself so that you can also chat with a uh, little, uh, with Dr. Banerjee. Uh, I am a <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, it was uh... No, no, I have a busy schedule. The only thing is that I have a monthly meeting fitting continuously. So, I you know, long. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah, more busy, more busy from home, actually. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So, Prono, may I request you to now off the sharing of screen so ca we can start the program. May I request Prono stop sharing the screen? Mm. Prono, kindly stop sharing the screen so that I can start the program formally. So that I can start the program. PowerPoint is not working. I do request my departmental faculties to keep their video on so that you can all of uh, Tridhi will be introduced to you and I would like to introduce all of you to Tridhi though all the teachers are not here okay so Dr. Tridhi Banerjee I am going to introduce formally Tridhi before that just informally I am introducing other faculties uh, she is Dr. Amrita Mukherjee from Department of Zoology Vijay Krishna Girls College uh, we are actually six faculties, uh, five faculties in our department. Everybody is not present and due to network issues, you know, uh, it is impossible for everybody to uh, be on the screen. So participant, welcome. 
and a big welcome to Dr. Triti Banerjee. Now I am going to introduce Dr. Banerjee uh, to you, all dear participants. And this is the eighth day. We are running successfully our student development program, and this is, ma'am, our eighth day. And approximately 230 participants are regularly taking part in it. They are being given assignments. They are completing the assignments and everything. So we are really thankful to the students for their participation. Now, participants who are going to hear from Dr. Triti Banerjee, who is the scientist team and joint director of Zoological Survey of India. Under the aegis of the Ministry of Environment of Forest and Climate Change. Driti actually joined ZSI as a research scholar and started working on biodiversity and conservation, focusing on taxonomy, molecular systematics, and biodiversity of the flies. She had initiated molecular research, basically the molecular taxonomy part in ZSI, and at present, she is involved in pollinator species mapping and vector modeling, which is very latest update of taxonomy and obviously zoology. Uh, she is known as the lady of the flies, and she is now into the science of criminal forensic and is trying to find suitable models of fly species which can be used for crime detection in Indian environmental condition to aid law enforcing agencies. So that is a very, very unique approach of the research. Dr. Banerjee is also the lady behind the digital ZSI, you all must know. An extremely ambitious program which would enable all researchers wildlife enthusiasts, students, and anyone interested in biodiversity to access approximately one lakh species of fauna of India by simply clicking mouse. So that is amazing, I must say. Great job, ma'am. Dr. Banerjee has conducted several symposium and workshops for the students of, for their biodiversity studies. She has worked closely with Ramakrishna Mission and rendered her technical expertise to develop the Museum of Man and Environment at RKM Vidyapit Narendupur. Beside, Dr. Banerjee has delivered, obviously, several popular scientific talks throughout uh, India, abroad, as well as in Akashwani and Dukdarshan. Dr. Banerjee has authored more than 10 books, 120 research articles, and 20 book chapters, and quite a few popular articles. She is a member of more than 15 learned societies, obviously both national and international level, including the Rotary Foundation. And she is also member of an all-women Rotary Club. Dr. Banerjee was recently conferred on International Women's Day 2018 with an award, Exceptional Women of Excellence. So we women must be proud, Excellence, by the Economic Forum at the Hege, Netherlands. So ma'am, we are really privileged to have you with us and students, you will be enriched with this kind of latest knowledge of zoology from Dr. Triti Banerjee. So ma'am, uh, now we have another two faculties from the Department of Zoology, Dr. Moniru Jamam and Dr. Shadhuka. They are all junior faculty members of our department. We do also have two senior faculty members who are now not over here. That's why they uh, were unable to join. So ma'am, it's over okay. to you now. And if you want to interact with the student, then whenever you will give a break, we will unmute them if they raise their hand and they will put all their question and answer in their question answer box and chat box. We can directly pick up question answer and they are whatever query they are making and will deliver to you. And they can obviously interact with you directly 
when we will allow them to talk so ma'am it's up to you you can share your screen you can share your ppt thank you so much papia uh let me uh, shutting off my video with okay. your okay. permission and okay. muting myself ma'am okay. okay thank you thank you uh, can you see me yes absolutely you can see my powerpoint isn't it yeah you have started exactly okay. fine ma'am Yes. it's on screen okay yeah. okay so uh, good afternoon everybody and uh, hi i am uh, driti banerji and you must be very surprised uh, looking at my first slide because taxonomy and systematics and amazon.co.in doesn't actually go together but it is something which i'd like to bring today to a lot of you notice uh, i mean to your notice because all of you are young kids and i think it will be very interesting to know that how you can link up linear and jeff bezos together so let me go to the next slide uh, next slide jabo ki kore okay so when we talk about Be um, uh, jeff bezos what is the first thing which comes to our mind the immense amount of wealth which he has accumulated during his time especially during the lockdown in 2020s so if you go for any product which is on the amazon and if you go back and look say it may be a beauty product it may be a food product it may be a say uh, something a utility product a leather bag a belt you'd see the composition behind it you'd see the name of the item which goes to make the product so who gave the name of the item who decided that this product is called this then you go back to linnaeus the father of taxonomy so because it was bezos and because it was linnaeus and because it was wealth of the nation so that is why we have brought together the two people who are most unrealistically linked together ever in the world of science or in the world of taxonomy so what i'm going to do today is i'm going to tell you how you going to make taxonomy work for you and how you can make money by studying this subject so because everything today now works in the terms of money and your finances and whether chakri pave ki na so that will be one of the most interesting things to see whether you can make such a boring subject work in your favor like whenever it is say we go to faunal diversity when we have used a term okay so the one thing is that suppose we have come to the title of faunal diversity so why have i come to the conservation contact of the in my second or the third slide why have i started the conservation because we think the most important uh, import uh, i mean not connotation of amassing wealth is always saving wealth so when you are saving money you have more money in your bank account and then you become rich similarly if we save our fauna if we save our diversity and we conserve them then we become rich as a nation so that is the way why i started off with this so why is it very important in india the whole concept of diversity and biodiversity because india is a mega diverse nation we are encompassing almost the eurasian palearctic the afrotropical ethiopian and the indomalayan component of the zoo geographical regions and we have today at present 1,181 species documented from india so the reason if you see on my screen you will see a very uh, uh, you see a classroom basically because i'm uh, talking to you people who are all students so i thought this uh, picture would be very relative to it so in this classroom today we are also thinking about the next step about what you are supposed to do so when we talk about studies by studying biodiversity we start with collection preservation identification inventorization documentation conservation 
Then we later move on to studying of phylogeny, studying of distributional modeling, studying of ecological niche assessment, and finally framing and management, uh, framing management strategies for conservation plans. So now let's go back to Linnaeus again. So let's begin with the taxonomy. Why? When you see this pyramid, these are the levels which you are extremely familiar with. There is a kingdom, there is a phylum, there is a class, there is an order, there's a family, there's a genus, there is a species. So this is something which you have been studying since class 12, then you studied it in graduation and maybe you'll again go ahead and study, study during your post-graduation. So when it is taxonomy, what is the science of taxonomy? Whenever you see any species or any uh, anything around you, the first thing which strikes you, who am I? What is this? So what is this? Who gives you that answer of what is it? The answer is given by a taxonomist. Why? So because the taxonomist deals with the science of taxonomy, which aims in discovering, naming, describing, and classifying species or classifying organisms. Why? To understand biodiversity and to do a lot more. So when you start, you start with discovering a new, something new. The very most important thing about taxonomy is that it will always, you go on discovering new stuff all along your career. The second is you Name, want to name, when you've discovered something, you want to give a name to it. This name is a scientific name, which is a universal name and which is going to be pertaining in history long after when you are dead. So if you have discovered something and you've given a name, it is going to stay back like the songs of Kishore Kumar, like the songs of Asha Bhosle, long after, like the songs of R.D. Burman, who are all dead now, but you still listen to them. So your name will be there in the history long after you are dead. The third one, the third stage is describing the species which you have described, which you have discovered. So this is the different stages of description. And the fourth stage is classifying the organism which you have discovered. Uh, Papi, I think everything is fine. You can hear me, isn't it? Exactly, exactly, okay. ma'am. If any okay. problem, I am here. I will let me, uh, me okay. and Shuja and my all other colleagues are with you. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think everybody can see the screen also. Exactly. No... Classifying, yeah. Absolutely yeah. Okay. fine. Okay. And okay. you are also in the screen. Thank you. Thank you. So the next thing is that that when you see classify organisms, you can see that there is a hierarchy from kingdom, phylum, class, infra class, order, subfamily, genus, and species. So after classification, so whatever you've discovered at one point of time, you name it, you add your, you characterize it, and then you classify it, and then your job becomes complete. And you literally, if it is a published document, then you become immortal in the world of science. So after this stage, the next important reason is that naming, scientific naming. Why does it matter? Say, for example, your name is Pompey, called by your mother your, or somebody call your mashi calls you mampi, your father calls you papu, your grandfather calls you mamoni. So, but there is only one name which is in your Aadhaar card or your passport or your birth certificate or your PAN card or your voter ID card. So that is a name which is known universally for you. So similarly, nomenclature or giving a taxonomic or a scientific name is a universal name which is given to an organism who can be recognized all over the world by the same name. There is no confusion between Pompi, Rumpi, Shampi, Wampi or anything of it. So that is the importance of scientific naming. Why is it scientific naming so important? Scientific naming is extremely important because it's help, because it helps you to distinguish between what is harmful and what is good. For example, if there is a pest, there is a bug. There may be 20 bugs I mean, going around in a crop field, but there may be only one bug which is dangerous and which is pestilential. So you, will you spend money in killing all the 20 bugs or will you select one particular uh, one method of killing only the particular bug which is pestilential? So it saves money. Secondly, 
it helps you to know what is good for you and what is bad for you. Say, for example, it is a poisonous mushroom. If you don't know its name, you don't know its characters, you may eat a poisonous mushroom and you may die. So that is where it becomes extremely important. The third important thing is that the, it is extremely relevant to the field of biodiversity. The entire taxonomic studies are the basic and key structure for any biodiversity study. Now, one thing I have to go behind and say just, say for example, in your curriculum, when I use the term biodiversity, your eyes will all shine because it will give you a feeling of Beer Groyles and Narendra Modi going around Kanha and that kind of a national geography feel to it. But do you know that the biodiversity starts? But if I say again, okay, you have a class on taxonomy and systematics, you'll say, oh, Baba, ki faltu subject re, Baba, awar putte hai. So this feeling, AJ feeling Tashe, the biodiversity is something very catchy and very adventurous, whereas taxonomy and systematics is something which is very dull and humdrum, is very, very paradoxical because the basic of any biodiversity study is always the science of taxonomy. So why is taxonomy so important? Because it helps us categorizing the diversity or it helps us categorizing the biodiversity of our living world into intelligible units which you and me and a common person can understand. Say for example, if you go into any superstore, this is simple categorizing. When this simple categorization is involved or intruncated into the scientific system, that helps, it brings in a kind of regularization and categorization of intelligible units, which you and me and everybody else from a layman to a scientist can understand. Taxonomy also forms a basis of extremely important basic sciences like conservation science, genetic sciences, evolutionary biology, biodiscovery, geography, bio, biogeography, medicines, and a lot more. It also helps in biodiversity conservation because it is the basic study of identification, discovery, nomenclature, and phylogeny, which helps to know whether the import species is important or not. And Taxonomy helps in assessing climate change. For example, in Zoological Survey of India and Botanical Survey of India, the place where I work, we have huge amount of collection spanning 100 or 200 years. It is the change in the structure of, a, of the fauna which we are collecting over a period of time allows us to understand whether these components of these species are still available or not available. So it is these important collections which are very important. Then taxonomy also helps us in assessing the invasive species or invasive pest management. It will help, which is a major component in helping in policy and decision making. The site is the, uh, in the site is the endangered species category, the vulnerable species, the threatened species, all of them are dependent on the science of taxonomy. It also helps in biodiscovery and of several important components. For example, the marine sponges can produce almost, or the say for example, not marine, I mean the marine, uh, 70 or 80% of the marine sponges, which are undiscovered, in and below in the, I mean, somewhere in the very deep inside the ocean floor, they produce almost 10% of the antibodies known and unknown to human beings. So the amount of wealth which we have and which is still to be discovered is huge. And that is also a contribution of the taxonomic studies. There is another concept, the biosecurity and trade. Now you know that biosecurity is something very interesting. For example, all say for example, now COVID is so important. So all the people who are coming from abroad into your country, they have to be tested for COVID through either an RT-PCR RT test or a swab test or an antibody test. So these are the kind of things which identifies a particular strain of the virus. Similarly, 
the tech, that is also a form of taxonomic identification. So here also in biosecurity, it's very important because we may be importing or exporting products which may contain some dangerous uh, live elements which may go and wreak havoc in other countries. For example, when people from Italy came and spread the COVID in India, had we had me me I mean, mechanisms of identification at that point of time in February, today we would not be suffering the way we are suffering today. So when they came in from Italy, the uh, tourists, they should have been, had they been screened, then this won't have happened. So taxonomy is a study in advancing our knowledge, not only for very big organisms like the tiger, the panda, or the blue whale or the polar bear or the cheetah, but it is also for very small organisms like a dengue mosquito or a mosquito aegis or a aegis mosquito carrying a Zika virus or a malaria mosquito. It is important both ways. The challenge of the text to the taxonomist is that they have to deal with people, I mean, with organisms which may be very big or which may be very small, but both of them have immense impact on the environmental system around us. Okay, so now because I have more or less covered, given you a brief idea about what the basic science of taxonomy is. So we start off, it is a very big umbrella. So let us say, how do you start get, getting into the subject of studying taxonomy? It is not a very interesting subject. When I was an undergraduate, I hated it. I, to be very honest, I hated it. But now at this point of time, I find the whole thing extremely interesting because there are nuances to it, which I never understood when I was in my undergrad class. So let's say, let's start with a very broad thing. Let's say the cosmos, you know, it's a very broad term. It's a very huge, huge concept, the cosmos. So now you gradually narrow down from cosmos, a component of the cosmos is a Milky Way. A part of the Milky Way is a solar system. So you are gradually narrowing down. A part of the solar system is our planet Earth. So think about it. Then on, in the planet Earth, there is a part which is the oriental region and your country falls in the oriental region, which is our country, India. In India, there is a state which is West Bengal. In West Bengal, there is a city called Kolkata. In Kolkata, there is an organization called ZSI and in ZSI is my address in New Walipur is where I am sitting and doing my work. So if we go from the broader aspect and we come down, say from Cosmos to my address in ZSI, that we form a very small portion of the living animal world. See, you see so many people around, we form a very small portion of the living world. So the <clears throat> so now if you see the tree, you can understand that if you see the man who is on top, but he is only one component component of so many organisms which form the biodiversity of our living world. So now if we go to the broader picture again, so if this is a whole picture, then one component of the living world is archae, the other component is a bacteria, there is another main component is a protista, there is kingdom plantae, kingdom fungi, and kingdom animalia. So this forms your entire living world, and this is the complete biodiversity spectrum. So once we have dealt with taxonomy, I have been able to tell you that it covers a very large area, which is the entire living world, and instead of going into the components of the living world, I would want, what I would want to do is that, I would want to share with you the very simple thing is that how will you narrow down your science into something which is very uh, easy for you to understand. When I said in the beginning, you remember intelligible units, so instead of going into the details of the animal world, I'll take up only one component of the animal world, which are the insects. <clears throat> so to study the whole subjects, let me take an example, the largest animal taxa, which is insect. So we, whenever we are doing taxonomic studies, the first important thing is that, why are we doing the study? Suppose you have certain organisms around you, it's very important to delineate 
the importance of studying that particular organism. Then the next step will be in deciding what the organism is. In order to decide what the organism is, you will have to know the characters of the organism. If you remember in the beginning, I said, once in the process of discovery, the first thing is identify, I mean, characterization of the organisms. The characters can be based on different uh, features of that particular organism. Say, for example, for insects, it is antenna, which may be of various types. Again, insects are organisms which have jointed appendages and the body is divided into head, thorax and abdomen. So th they have two pairs of wings or in some cases the wings may be different types. They may be membranous, they may be scaly or they may be reduced to halters. So again, so these are the characters if I go back, which decides why and helps you in describing an organism which you are studying in the science of taxonomy. The next component is that once you've decided that this insect belongs to this category, then you will be assigning the insect along a classification hierarchy. So here now you have say, for example, 29 to 32 insect orders. And these are the commonest insect orders I have described and I'm trying to show because of, you know, it's a very small paucity of time. So what you do once you have identify the insect based on their characters, you will be able to, <coughs> sorry, you will be able to understand that there are so many categories of insects which you may be studying. Now, the, uh, for example, these are all winged insects. These are wingless insects. And then the issue again goes back, like for so many insects which you are studying, how many of them are important and how many of them are important to the work or relevant to the work which you'll be doing at present. So now once you've come to the insects and have studied that you have a winged insect or a, or a non-winged insect. So the, the issue now is that how have you brought that insect into your laboratory for study? So once it is, once we have gone, I mean, have a set of organisms sitting on a table, say, for example, a set of insects which you have collected. So it's very important to know that how you have collected the insects from the field. So that these are the different methods by which you collect the insects from the field. For example, you have to take a photograph, <clears throat> you have to record a GPS, you have to store them. These are the different habitats which from which you can collect the insects. So even if the signs so sound so drab, but there is a feel of national geographic to it because you have to go all around the country to find and the particular type of insect which you are working on. Okay. You can also lay different traps for collecting the insects, or you can also see them growing on live organisms or carcasses, and you can collect the different stages and work on them. Or you can use larger field or different types of now ele electronic or non-electronic traps like a malaise trap or a pan trap or UV light trap. Or you may use a glue trap. You can use different types of light traps. You can use pheromone traps. You can rear, you can bait the insects. And ultimately you collect those insects and you bring them to your laboratory. In all of your uh, colleges, you may find these insect drawers. So once you have brought in the insect from the laboratory, uh, from the field, you'll be spinning and setting and pinning them in this format where you will have all the groups in one box. These insects, when they are handled by the specialist, they say, for example, here you will be finding all the insects are in one box, but for specialists who are working on particular groups, they will be segregating the insects in separate boxes, like the way we do in Zerisec. The next stage will be identification of the insects using a very high specialized microscope. <clears throat> now, once you identify, you understand what the insect is. Then you start working on the fact whether the insect is harmful or the insect is dangerous. Or whether the insect is good for you or is it bad for the society. So there are several insects which are villainous. For example, the mosquito, the locust. The, these are the insects which cause a tremendous amount of losses in agricultural fields. 
these are the mosquito causes malaria you know that very well the trypanosomiasis is caused by the phlebotomus or the set sea fly the sara disease is caused by tabanidae so these are the insects once so what i go back is that so once you are studying this subject you you go to the field you collect the insects you bring it back to the laboratory you identify them and you try to figure out this is important to the society in what way is it being a vector or is it dangerous or is it providing something good for the society for example the insects are major pollinators you know that because they are major pollinators there be no chocolate or no food if insects were never there think about it so the insects may be dangerous <clears throat> at the same time they provide extremely important ecosystem services to our society in general other than this the insects also produce say for example your mother silk sari that is also produced by an insect again insects have huge amount of nutrient recycling capacity and they increase the fertility of your soil so that is a ecosystem service provided by them another thing is that they are for the the insects are very important flies are very important in assessing you know the uh, 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 i mean the death and decomposition timing and they are called as sherlock holmes in the entomology uh, entomological sciences because they can decide when and how a uh, death has occurred or at what time and i have been working on this for a very long time but i won't go into the details they are also important in using for maggot debridement therapy or for production of different types of pharmaceutical components which are used where you can use insect uh, metabolites which are used in those pharmaceutical and cosmetic components so now so we have seen that we have both heroes and villains in the uh, animal world and it is taxonomy which helps us to mark those who are warriors and those who are the convicts so once you have so till now what i have been explaining is how you identify how do you bring how do you collect how do you preserve how you identify and how do you categorize a particular organism or a particular species now today the modern taxonomy taxonomy or the science of taxonomy is not only restricted to classification in the historical perspective we have done dna barcoding and here i have to go back a little bit on zoological survey of india because we are the dharok or bahok of the entire faunal wealth of our country because we contain what you say what you see the national library as your reference book zsi is the library of the entire taxonomic wealth as far as the fauna is concerned of our country so this is our huge collection which we have and this collection is accessible to everybody who wants to work in the science of taxonomy so till now it was about what taxonomy was why the science is important what are the different connotations of the science now you being students who are the future of tomorrow so it is our when once you are doing taxonomic studies you need certain tools and and technologies to i mean carry forward your research if you if you want to work on it the zoological survey of india provides you with that tool and technology so that you can carry forward your taxonomic studies if you are interested to do it so we have a huge collection which is digitized completely digitized and that is called as a as zoological survey of india faunal information system where you can access any of the species with a click of a mouse so once you are describing a species you need to know or compare with a particular species which is already known to science before you decide that it is new to science so this are the photographs we also have our collections and we also have the photographs today digitized in case you cannot access the collections immediately you can go back and see these photographs and you try to know the specimen which you have collected from the 
field or from a forest is exactly which species. This is an insect. You will also find a mammal. You will find a bird. You will find a reptile. You will find a uh, amphibia. All the groups are digitized in extremely high resolution photographs. Now, in order to understand that which part of this, uh, I mean, the, of the specimen which you which we are studying, what is the relevant literature which describes it? So we also have the entire literature which is digitized and available on a platform. So that is the record fauna of India dot nic dot in, and you'll find the entire literature which describes species on that platform. So these are the different types of arc digital sources of literature which is available. We also have a interactive database for searching of species, which is in the process of being built up. And I think tomorrow or day, maybe in a few years time, you can find the entire Indian fauna on a searchable format. Like previously, this was the data which we have in our collection. But this would be the data of the entire Indian fauna, which is available on a searchable day format. And the next one is that we also are developing a site of digital sequence information, which is the DNA barcode of the fauna, which is available in ZSI. And approximately in ZSI, we have around 4 million uh, specimens. And we expect to do at least a barcoding of 2 million specimens, which are now available with us and the specimens which maybe come, come to us from the other resources. So DNA barcoding, I've already highlighted you. So uh, before I go uh, beyond it, I just want to go back and say something here. The facilities which I have provided, which we are providing is ZSI is free. These are the facilities which we are providing. but the same facilities when they are provided by other museums or institutes, they charge money for it. So when I said from Linnaeus to Bezos, so if this photo is going to be sold in Amazon, then it can fetch me at least five to $10 or maybe 10 to 15 pounds per photograph. So if we have a contract with the Amazon, we can actually send, sell the barcode or the photograph or the digitized literature with rest of the world does. They don't do it through Amazon, they do it through their own portals. So my concept of saying is that, that if you're working on a group, on a subject like taxonomy, it's not like it is something which is a very backdated subject. In fact, it is an extremely important revenue generating subject. You can produce a barcode and you can sell it. The moment a person uses your barcode, you may be given a royalty from that product. So that is the thing of generation, generating a revenue from the work you do. So it's not basically a very outdated or old subject. Okay, the next part of it is that we in ZSI, we are also doing phylogenetic studies of all the Indian fauna. This is a one in the spider fauna. We are also involved in cryptic species identification. Through, bar, I mean, for through DNA mitogenomic analysis, we are also doing species complex detection, which is a very important study in the sense that it helps in you to understand whether a particular species in a complex, which may be venomous, which may be pest, which may be a predator, which may be something very parasite, in a particular complex, may not be the other species of the complex may not have all those attributes. So that would prevent from irrationally killing all the specimens in and around when you try to identify only one particular pest or a parasite. We are also using different types of, uh, we are also doing different types of uh, mitochondrial genomic studies to analyze the uh, endangered species the species which are also in CITES category. So these are all, okay, these are all a part of the taxonomic studies. Don't think that this is something because it is molecular biology, it's got nothing to do with taxonomy and uh, systematics or phylogenetics. It is also a part of the basic taxonomic studies, only that you are using a new tool of DNA barcoding. You are using a microbiological tool to ascertain whether this particular species is this 
or how is the distribution pattern of this species in the world today? The beyond ZSI, we are also doing a lot of world wildlife forensic studies and conservation genetic studies, and we are providing advisory services free of cost. So these are the different types of you know avenues where you can groom yourself because these are very specialized areas of science where you don't have many specialists and these are niche areas. So if you can train yourself for doing this, this is going to provide you with, with employment in the future in either a wildlife criminal laboratory or a forensic laboratory or in organizations like ZSI, BSI, ASI or with the police or something like that. See, these are the different, see, we got some pangolin scales, you are using different types of uh, tricks. This is a Caesar of pangolin scales where we got scales from two different uh, pangolins. One was from China and was one of ones was from West Bengal. So we could decide using the different DNA studies, which that, that the scales which were seized where whether it was a Ch Chinese pangolin scales or an Indian pangolin scales. And that in fact, help the for a wildlife forensic uh, uh, criminal wildlife criminal laboratory to actually nail down whether there was cross-border poaching or cross-border animal trafficking going on see it's not only child trafficking or organ trafficking or something like that trafficking involves a lot of things when we are working in animals so we are bothered about extremely bothered about animal trafficking and animal poaching so this was a study which was done uh, between Chinese and other than this, there is also live animals being, uh, uh, I mean, being seized and which is brought to ZSI for, uh, for identifying whether or which, which point of uh, they could, which they belong to which population that is also can be analyzed by us. So for example, these are some of the screenshots from that live animal trafficking. So today in ZSI, we are providing a lot of, you know, uh, uh, inputs to the Wildlife Protection Act and to all these organizations, which I'm showing on my screen uh, for conservation and management. So other than this, there is a, there is the, so that part of it is uh, that conservation and management is one job. The other part of the work which we are doing at present is as analyzing the entire Indian fauna on a GIS grid for the entire India. So here you can see the different species modeling based on bioclimatic variables, anthropogenic variables, topography, wilderness, landscape configuration, landscape configuration variables. So here we have been working, say for example, we are working on climate change. So this is a climate change model, model of Himalayan langur, which shows that how the langur has been, what is the present status? What is the predicted status in 2050? So this is the present status. And this is a way the habitat is going to change. And so the distribution of the langur is going to change when it is 2070 and where we must interject and provide for corridors so that the habitat, so even if the habitat degrades, the langur is still available in the wild and we can still detect them in the wild. So this is another study which we are now conducting in ZSF. So we are also having a long-term conservation and management studies in the Himalayan region where we are doing biodiversity assessment, long-term monitoring the Himalayan landscapes and then for the different taxa, which I'm showing here. There is also a long-term uh, uh, conservation and threatened vertebrate fauna of India, which we are working on. And we are working on different study areas in the Himalayas, especially the entire Himalayan belt is now we are working in the entire Himalayan belt from the Western and uh, between the Western and the Eastern Himalayas. And we have got some extremely good results in the sampling. And this is a grid based sampling, which we have done. And we have identified the areas and there have been re new records of vertebrates from these areas. And this is the, and we have also mapped the different geospatially, the wild boar, the golden jackal and the gray wolf. So here I want to tell you one thing. See this mapping, when I started off collecting in the, uh, collecting the insects in the uh, forest, you could never imagine that this is the output of it. I mean, when a person goes in the forest, he may encounter a wild boar or a jackal or a gray wolf. And that may be projected in a map 
which will show the, the present status, the status 20 years from now, and the status 50 years from now on a predictive analysis model. And you can actually go and tell the policymakers, like, look, this is what is going to happen 20 years from now, or maybe this is what is going to happen 50 years from now. And you should be taking measures to see that the habitat does not, of these particular areas, does not change so drastically that the population of these particular animals will collapse or they will clash. So this is also a part of the taxonomic studies. So other than that, say we are studying the insects. I told you mosquito, I mean, malaria mosquitoes, <coughs> dengue vector. So we also did a dengue vector surveillance management. And after that, we could synthesize an eco-friendly mosquito biolarvicide, which is now actually, it has crossed the clinical trials, the, Municipal Corporation and the Calcutta Municipal Corporation had taken it on a trial. It was a successful trial and this is now in the process of being sold. So the mosquito Linnaeus and now it is being sold. So Amazon comes in, Bezos comes in and you can actually, you have started. The person who is now, who has produced it is actually seeing a little bit of profit. So I think it works. So the whole concept of what I told you in the beginning that we have a wealth, which is a faunal wealth, which is a huge biodiversity. That wealth has to be saved, conserved and nourished so that we can become richer and richer in course of time. So with this, I like to end my I mean, discussion saying that even if taxonomy and systematics is something which people and students at the basics don't want to study, but that in the long run can be extremely revenue generating because today it is involved with so many different types of technologies, tools, and your deliverables have increased so much that you can actually be making money by either practicing it, by studying it, by utilizing it, by selling it in any form possible. So now it is open to question. Thank you, Papi. Thank you, Dr. Banerjee, for such a nice <coughs> elaboration. We really, I think very few of us have really a detailed idea about what is the latest contribution of ZSI in case of yes. animal science or rather for overall biodiversity. So uh, it is very enlightening. Uh, there are a few questions as well as few. Uh, okay. Shall I'll I take some questions, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. Banerjee? Okay. I'll take the questions. Maybe. Yeah, you can you can directly check. Sriparna Chatterjee. Uh, can she come online? I cannot open the chat box. Can uh, she come online and tell me anything? Exactly. Ask me. Can she ask okay. me directly? I think. Yeah. Online. I'm doing she can that. unmute her mic and uh, unmute yeah. her video and can. Yeah, uh, yeah. Just a minute, ma'am. Participants, I am unmuting you. You just ask, ma'am, directly. Three, four, nice, R, double E. Okay, okay, I got it. Ma'am, how, yeah, how is pheromone trapping done? Can you hear me, Sriparna? One minute. Sriparna, you unmute yourself. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, how is pheromone trapping done? You'll be using, see, pheromone trapping is done uh, in a different types of ways where you can buy synthetic pheromones from the market and then you can layer it, layer it on a kind of a gluey substance, which is usually a sugary gluey substance on which the insect will come and sit. Once it sits, then they get stuck and take it out. Okay. okay. Simplest is that for flies, we sometimes, you see beer bottle scans, they are used as trapping. Then uh, if you see pocha apple, pocha cola, you know, they are good traps <laughs> because they have loads of sugar in them. Even sugar, sugar solution, if you soak it in a 
kind of suppose you've gone in the field and you don't have a pheromone so what do you do you get to kola chotke tar modhe to chini de rakhbe you will see insects coming in and sitting on them and then you can take that them. that too will attract them i mean uh, yeah, yeah, that, yeah 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 I mean, firstly, pheromone trapping is done usually when you are working at a very, say, advanced level of work. Like suppose, if you are in college, if you go, then you have to take a pocha kola, apple, papel, or something. March, March, or something. You have to go and see if there are insects or something. That is enough to trap. Okay. okay. Um, uh, Ma'am, uh, can you kindly explain about eco-friendly mosquito bioalarvicidal products you uh, showed uh, there in this slide? Oh, it, oh, it, na onik khani aache. Ota ekta larvicidal product. Amra ekta extensive surveillance kore they had designed the product. Oh, ita dopora ta seminar hoy chila madhe. When we launched that product, umi ota ei time ta toto hobe na because it is a very long thing. আমি তোমাকে ডক্টর সুমনের ফোন নাম্বার ইমেল দিয়ে দেবো হু হ্যাড প্রডিউসড ইট হু ওয়ার্কস ইন মাই ল্যাব ওনলি সো ইউ ক্যান টক টু হিম ডাইরেক্টলি এন্ড গেট ইউজ অফ ইট ইফ ইউ ওয়ান্ট টু ইউজ ইউ ক্যান ইভেন বাই ইট ওকে আমি তোমার ম্যাডামকে হয়তো ওনার ওই ডক্টর সুমনের নাম্বারের ইমেলটা দিয়ে দেবো ইউ ক্যান টেক ইট ফ্রম হিম ইফ ইউ ওয়ান্ট টেক ইট ফ্রম হার ইফ ইউ ওয়ান্ট সুরজিত <laughs> Surajit okay. you can ask your question directly unmute yourself and ask your question to ma'am directly Can you hear me Surajit Surajit I have Hello ma'am তুমি যদি রেয়ার বুকস চাও তাহলে লাইব্রেরিতে গিয়ে দেখতে হবে আর তুমি যদি কোন জিনিস আমাদের একটা ওপেন সাইট আছে মনে থাকবে পাবলিকেশন আছে ইনক্লুডিং ইন্ডিয়ান মিউজিয়াম এর যে কালেকশন সেইটা পুরোটা ডিজিটাইজ করা আছে টিল টোয়েন্টি থার্টিন If you go to National Digital Library of India, NDLI, our NDLI has a link to the NDLI. So, our NDLI has updated that if you have a particular species, you can search for the species, they will give you the details, start to keep, well, publish literature, you can go to the shop, you can go to the shop, you can go to the shop. You get all published literature on that particular group. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, your slides were very beautiful and attractive. Thank you. Thank you. I hope I've been able to because that subject is very drab. So, every time we do something different. And because the uh, whole taxonomy subject has developed and advanced so much, that amra shobai bhabe zsi ekono microscope e boshe kaaj kore exactly exactly amader zsi te ekono scientist ra microscope boshar time i paye na tara noy pahare ghure beracche na na hoy computer e boshe ache it's come to that level now so but what we are trying to do over the ages tomane moto interested lokjon if you try to develop this interest on this subject tate kore ki hoy je you know lot more people studying lot more people become aware about it and then emni ekta naturalist dekhbe bone jongole gele shobari kanna bhalo lage so amra chai amra chai je ei jinish ta tomader moddhe aro baruk you have that sense of ye ar dekhtei to pachho je at the end of lockdown it is the virus which has taken over the world over everything else ekhon karur ke ekhon du tin ta jinish er lokar matha betha so the living world has become suddenly very important about 
start studying that, I think it will be a big thing. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Okay, you mute yourself next. Deb Debadrita or Debrita, I have uh, allowed you to talk. You can unmute. You have given some question probably. Hello, good oh. evening, ma'am. Yeah, good evening. Tell audible? Me. Yeah, I'm audible. I'm audible. Ma'am, uh, what is the fruitfulness of the relevance of the quadrant method of insect collection when compared to other methods which you discuss now? The quadrant method is if you're doing biodiversity studies. For example, you are studying a pest. Or maybe, so suppose you are uh, studying a fruit fly pest, say a tephritid pest. So there you decide on quadrates to decide whether that what is the abundance of the species, how much is the species richness in that particular area, and whether it is crossing the threshold limit or whether it is... So quadrate method is very important for biodiversity studies. You know, that is one of the techniques when you are doing biodiversity assessments. So you're saying in one, once we go out in the field, if we have find a good patch, we also dis work on in form of quadrates only. It's not like we go for random sampling. Even when we are going for random sampling, we always try to keep a quadrate so that we can go back and work on some, you know, uh, the quantitative uh, output of the survey which we have done. So quadrate may method is fruitful and is useful also. Okay, but okay, I, ne so I never discussed the quadrate method. I just discovered the basics of I know, I mean, 45 minutes, I can't go into all the techniques because the techniques and the methodology is another two hour lecture. So there once, I mean, if possible, if sometime again, I come back for that methodology, then we can discuss on this, but you can also go to ZSI. You can check out ZSI website where we are conducting workshops all the time. So it may be on insects, it may be on butterflies, it may be on uh, exactly. coleopterans, it may be on fishes, vertebrates. There, when we are discussing, we discuss in details all the methodologies for, you know, collection of the species, or we have a separate collection preservation training program. So you can, if you have any queries on that, you can also go and join to see how this thing is effective over all the funnel groups, which we work on. Okay. Thanks a lot, ma'am. You're always welcome. Just go to the ZSI website, zsi.gov.in. We have these, you know, continuous workshops, webinars, something or the other is always happening. So you can join in and it's usually free. Only thing, they will see your marks and your qualifications and they will accept you according to, you know, your merit. But it is free. So, I mean, merit has to come in. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Then Anisha Mojumdar, you have some question probably. I have allowed you to talk. You can unmute yourself. Anisha. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, good evening, ma'am. I am Anisha. Uh, yeah. yeah. Hi. So I saw that in one of your slides, you mentioned about human wildlife conflict. And yeah. uh, I, what I wanted to ask was, do you guys only undertake survey or is there any conflict resolution also done? No, 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 no. Conflict resolution can be done only at the policy makers level by the forest department. Conflict resolution cannot be done by scientists who are working in ZSI or BSI. No? It can be done only at the who can physically go and do this is the forest department. So, so does, uh... that we can study the data and we can give them a suggestion like this is here but in most of the cases forest department don't take our suggestions regarding this because the problem is so acute that they have to take decisions immediately and these decisions are taken by the dg forest the ministry level at the ministry of environment forest and climate change by the secretary and the minister it's a very high level decision and discussion to be made so we don't, we can provide inputs after doing an assessment, but the actual resolution of the conflict will be done by them. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. We provide the inputs. What we do in ZSI is we provide the lab component of it after working in the field. Okay. But for those who have to do their job, for resolving the problem that they have to do in the, that is done by the forest department. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Next, Orpon Bosch, you have raised your hand. I have Hello, allowed you to talk. Okay. Huh? Yes, hi. Hello, ma'am. Yeah, I can hear Hello, you. Tell me. Ma'am, I have a question. Yeah, you are audible. Continue. Hey, Continue. Insects are. Yeah, say. Essentially, the insects are forensic studies. Insects, uh, forensic studies, are no important. So, it is just like an example. Like to. Oh, acha. Insects, forensic studies, are no important. 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 When a dead body, when a person, suppose there is a dead body or a dead animal carcass or anything, which is there in the open, within five first five minutes, there will be a host of flies who will come and sit, especially on the nostrils, the openings, the orifices of the body, meaning the nose, the ear, and the mouth, and to some extent in the eyes. These flies will come for. When the body starts decomposing, it starts releasing volatile amino acids. These volatile amino acids or will try and it will attract these flies to come and sit on the body. Once they come in, these flies will lay eggs in the orifices. These eggs will or they will directly release the larva on the orifices. These larva will go inside the body. And once the body starts decomposing, the larva starts maturing, feeding on those dead decomposing. Uh, uh. Hello? Yes, ma'am, you are audible. I am Amrita Mukherjee from Department of Zoology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, hi. Tell very me, much tell audible, me. but uh, I think. I think uh, Dr. Ghosh is facing some. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was there was some problem. Yeah. Okay, ma'am. Uh, thank you very much for okay. your lecture. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And you, we had you, uh, we had a wonderful audience. Only thing is that uh, I couldn't see them face to face. So uh, that is the difference. You guys can always come back to ZSI if you want to listen. Thank you so yeah, much. I have. I. When I was uh, I was a PhD scholar, I uh, used to go to ZSI for my research articles and okay, uh, okay, that's good, that's good. So this is an open invitation for both the faculty and the students. Don't think that I am only inviting the students. I am also inviting the faculty to come down and have a look at the kind of work which we are doing now. Okay. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. So may I leave now? Yes, you can. Okay, okay. Thank you. Students, you wait. Our next session will start shortly. Uh, aim. Uh. Hi, ball. Hi, ball. Si, madam. Bolo, pakita shubi korte. Okay, sir. To me call karo. Already sip code, Hamad.
machine learning, which to me is how you can utilize these uh, basic understanding and advance your knowledge applying some of these techniques. So the first part will be more that is already in, in the book and you, will, you, you see them. And advanced learning will be how you can apply them, which is not yet uh, available in textbook uh, for the students. And my final part will be career guidance as Professor Gers has asked me to do it. And I'll talk mostly on PhD applications at Oxford um, or more, more generally uh, study abroad option, options, both uh, at postgraduate and PhD level. So to start off with, what is a uh, stem cell? Uh, I think many of you have either heard of it, stem cell, or uh, know what, what, what a stem cell is. Let me should go through one of the video. So it's easy for me to explain. So many of you are, know that uh, stem cells are basically germline cells in the beginning, which mean a sperm and an ovum when they when they when they traverse from from the sperms when they travel through the fallopian tube, there's millions of stem cells that that, that travel and finally one of the stem cell uh, binds to the ovum of the female counterpart, and there is a series of chemical reaction that blocks other uh, sperms to enter, which means only one sperm can enter into an egg. And after it enters into the egg, through so the fallopian tube, this is what happens is the sperm and the ovum get fused and form a collection of cells, which is called a zygote. Shown here is a zygote, as you can see, the zygote then divides like a mitotic division and it divides from two cell stage and the two becomes four, four becomes eight, eight becomes 16. And while you watch the video, let me, let me take your attention to the attached slide on the, on the left panel, where you can see how a fertilized oocyte gets divided to form a morula. And this morula then changed to eight and 16 cell state as the video is showing, is what we call as a blastula that comes from a terminology called blastocyst. And this blastula, is very interesting and I will talk about blastula in detail towards the end of the talk, mostly during that advanced learning. So I want to explain from the very beginning what a blastula is. So if you, if you cross-sect a blastula, you will see two different parts. One is a trophoblast layer, which is on the top of the, let me use the pointer here. Yeah, so I hope you, you can see my pointer. So if, if you cut a trophoblastula, you see on the top is a trophoblast, which is a very fluid filled cavity. The outer layer belongs of a trophoblast layer and the inner layer is called an inner cell mass. And this inner cell mass is a very important part for being an embryonic stem cell, because if we collect this inner cell mass, grow it in a dish, that is what we call as an embryonic stem cell. So now embryonic stem cells are, have, many different roles have many functions and has been revolutionized our understanding of, uh, of biology. Now, if we don't culture them in vitro, if we grow it in vivo, what happens inside a fallopian tube, this blastula then goes to another sequential stage, which is called a gastrulation, which means any morphogenetic events, the cell movement in order to form all the different cell types is what we call as a gastrula. Now this gastrula finally binds to the, to the layer of the fallopian tube, which we call as an implantation. And this gastrula implantation means the germ layers are defined, which means it forms the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. So ectoderm, as you know, ectoderm forms all the epidermis, like the skin, like the hair, uh, the brain. Most of the brain is actually ectodermal in origin. The mesodermal layer, the kidney, the blood cells are mostly the mesodermal layer, and the endoderma, which forms the inner lining of any organ types like the intestines, like the guts, the colon, uh, are mostly endodermal origin. And then in vivo, what happens is this embryo starts to develop all these different cell types. And finally, a fetus or an embryo forms inside the uh, fallopian tube, which we call as a mother's womb. And the embryo eventually develops, it grows through a, through a series of organogenesis, different organs starts to develop, mature, 
and then finally a baby is born. That's the whole scenario from a single sperm cell or a single ovum cell to a multicellular organ. That's how the multicellularity has evolved. And the first part is what happens inside a body. And the second part is happening what's happening inside the dish. Now, there are different types of potential. Not all cell types are equally competent to, to do this, this, this uh, experiment, to do this, this work. For example, I'll use the two important concepts is a totipotent and pluripotent, which are very interchangeably utilized in, uh, in, in scientific uh, literature. But uh, totipotent comes from the word called total potency, which means it has the potential to form any organ type uh, whatsoever. And pluripotency is also interchangeably used partly because pluripotent cells are not able to form the extraembryonic layers. Extraembryonic layers means the amnion chorion that actually protects the embryo because it's a very fragile structure when it's, 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 it's forming and needs to be protected by some layers of cells. And that's what we call an extraembryonic layers. So these pluripotent stem cells then forms there's all these different cell types of the germ layers, which are multipotent, which means it can form multiple different organs, like a same ectodermal cell is forming a skin, or it can form a tooth, it can form a mammary gland, it can form a hair, it can form a brain, or any other hypothalamus, cerebrum, cerebellum, whatsoever. And then as it differentiates, it takes a particular lineage, for example, a skin stem cell will eventually form a skin fibroblast, which means their potency is getting, getting decreased, which means it is taking its own lineage, forming it after cell fed, and it will form that particular cell type, which we call as a terminally differentiated or fully differentiated cell type. Now, if I come back to the dogma of which we have been using for many years now, how a stem cell divides, uh, what is pluripotency and differentiation. So if we consider a single stem cell, it can divide either symmetrically or asymmetrically. And what I mean by that is symmetrical division means both the stem cells will be divided equally. And what happens is after this division, it will form another stem cell, which, which has the exact same level of competency and potency to form with the parental stem cell. And the other part is an asymmetric division where a stem cell will now differentiate, which will not be going through another cell cycle and will form the same stem cell. Rather, it will push towards taking a particular lineage. For example, uh, they have to form a neuron. And now the stem cell will differentiate from a neuronal progenitor, that's an intermediate stage, and then the neuronal progenitor will differentiate and will form ultimately a neurons in a body. Some of the key definitions before I move on, because this will be particularly important uh, as throughout the slides, is two major cell types are present. One is then adult stem cells, which means any stem cells that are present in an adult body, like we all have stem cells in our body now. We have our skin stem cells, we have liver stem cells, um, we have kidney stem cells, but the other counterpart is an embryonic stem cells, which means, uh, the stem cells that are present in the blastocyst, as I showed previous slide, from the inner cell mass, which can form all the different organ types of the body. And as I said, they have, a, they have a unique property of self renewal, which means they can go multiple rounds of symmetric divisions without differentiation, and they retain the potential to, to divide and differentiate as and needed for the body. And pluripotency, as I've already said, has the ability to form all the three germ layers for different organ types, except the extraembryonic layers. And the final one is a, is a recent concept that many of you may be familiar with, is an induced pluripotent stem cells, which means starting from an adult fibroblast, for example, a skin cell, can be reprogrammed using some transcription factors and then utilized to form a pluripotent stem cell, which means it can form again a different cell type. So what happens is the major application being, uh, you take a skin stem cell, you reprogram it using some growth factors. Now it is now a stem cell and from a skin, now you can form a neuron. And it has revolutionized our understanding of biomedical research. And that's why it got the Nobel Prize 
uh, by Shinei Yamanaka and John Gurdon uh, a few years back. And the two important properties of stem cells, uh, which you may not be familiar now, but that's my part uh, in the next few slides, is to utilize the concept of self-organization and self-assembly of stem cells and how it can be used as different models for biomedical research, the central theme of today's talk. Now, if I go back to the evolution of stem cells, stem cell is not only present in, in human beings. It's present, if you go evolutionary, there are many species that has got stem cells within their body. Uh, and there's a reason behind it. Nothing in biology makes sense um, other than the light, uh, thinking in the light of evolution. And if you believe in evolution, uh, humans have got stem cells, uh, there must be a reason, and we must have got it from our ancestors, which means even lower invertebrates has the stem cells. Uh, the, the evolution tree might not be visible in the screen, but what I want to appreciate is there are many species in animal kingdom that has got stem cells, and not only in animal kingdom, even plants do get, uh, get stem cells uh, for a region. And there are some plants who do uh, regeneration as well. But since uh, today's audience are mostly zoology enthusiasts, I would uh, I'd, I'd stay on some of the key discoveries in the animal kingdom that led us to our understanding how stem cells have evolved and how stem cells have helped in our regenerative capacity. Well, as I say, humans and mammals uh, have got a certain extent of regenerative capacity, but uh, to a certain extent. Like we can regenerate our heart, our spinal cord, the digits, the hair cells, when we are at a developing state. And while we are at old, our, our liver can, can regenerate to some extent. Whereas mm, some, some deers, like those who have got the horns or the antlers, as you may know, they can regenerate their bone or the cartilage or the skin. But today, I will now move on to two unique animal species who actually show a whole body regeneration. Now you can see a difference between us and versus this lower invertebrates. We have a very limited regenerative capacity owing to the huge complexity of the organ structure of the human body. Whereas there are certain animal species in the animal kingdom that shows whole body regeneration and two unique examples being the planarian flatworms and the cnidarians hydra. Now, what are these planarians? Um, those who are watching from uh, West Bengal, I think you may have seen these unique species um, in the ponds. They mostly prefer to live in the dark. Uh, they are flatworms, um, which we call as an immortal worms. And I'll, I'll come back why we refer them as immortal. As you can see, the structure varies from different species, but in general, they have a very elongated structure. You can see a cartoon shaped eyes at the beginning, which acts as their photoreceptors. And I must say, uh, these animals don't like light. So if you, if you shine a light to them, these photoreceptors sense the light and they take it the other direction. And that's why you will find them in a pond under a rock or in a very dark and swampy areas. They have a pharynx in the middle, which acts as their feeding organ. And towards the end is the tail. And as you can see, there's a huge morphological difference between different animal species. But over the next few slides, I will talk mostly on this species called Schmittia mediterranea. And I was listening to Dr. Banerjee a few minutes back uh, as you have gone to the whole, the beauty of taxonomy. Uh, Schmittia mediterranea comes from the, uh, from the world because it was first identified in the Mediterranean Sea and hence the species called the Mediterranean. There are other species of Schmittia uh, that are widely used. The reason to establish uh, Schmittia mediterranea as a model, uh, partly because uh, the whole genome sequenced, uh, the transcriptome is very well assembled, there's several tools and technologies are available. And as you uh, can understand, to establish a model organism, you need to have certain advantages. And, and my job will be for the next few slides is to show you how we can utilize them uh, as a model for biomedical research. But bear in mind, I'll not talk in detail of several data-driven slides because I don't think that's the uh, major area for today's talk. Uh, but the, overview 
of, uh, of how we can use this novel uh, model system, which are not very established like the Drosophila, C. elegans, zebrafish, or the mice. Now, before I move to uh, what planarians are, let me uh, go through a history behind it. And many of you must be familiar with this uh, phenomenal personality, uh, Professor Thomas Hunt Morgan. Thomas Hunt Morgan is a celebrated scientist uh, since the 19th century. And I will be not surprised if we will be celebrating his work in the next few decades or more. Uh, 1910, the seminal paper by Thomas Hunt Morgan on the concept of chromosomes of heredity and the linkage map uh, that led to a Nobel Prize in 1933 for his phenomenal work on Drosophila genetics. But I want to uh, put it here, uh, Thomas Hunt Morgan actually started uh, studying planarians. Uh, many years back, he moved into Drosophila. And this is a paper from 1898 where Thomas and Morgan first published a report on the regeneration of planaria maculata. And as you may have assumed, I'm coming from Oxford and I spend most of the time in the library like any other uh, British universities. And I was fortunate to go through some of his micrographs from the 18th century. And here is a micrograph from Thomas Hunt book uh, from 1898 where he spent uh, several summers in the marine biological laboratory at the Woodsall in the United States, where he is to cut these animals into different parts, like any, any, any anchor you want. And as you can see, each of these animals then finally forms uh, this, this individual organ types. And this was the first report that planarians can regenerate in, in 18th century. And this is from different uh, time series from December to March and April, Unfortunately, when he, after the summer sabbatical, when he came back to his university in Columbia, uh, he couldn't uh, uh, keep this animal surviving uh, because they need certain conditions. Now, these are some of the questions that came to T.H. Morgan's mind when he was doing in the 18th century. I'll not go to all of the questions, but many of you who are listening now must be having these questions like any other uh, uh, any other uh, st students who are uh, who are first experiencing planarians, but I'll come back. None of these these are all outstanding questions that we're still trying to understand using planarians. And he said towards the end of his research paper that the material of the body is almost as plastic as that of an undivided or dividing egg. Now planarians have been classically used as a model for regeneration. You can cut these planarians into half. Each of these two individual parts can divide and regenerate to a completely different uh, animal. And they are, uh, they are complete intact full animal body. That's partly because the whole regeneration platform is very robust and rapid. Uh, so what I did first in the lab is I cut the head of the animal. As you can see, within 24 hours, the adjacent cells that are present within the, within the planarian is that starts to accumulate and closes the wound. Now this wound then closes and all the cells that are present here near the wound region, it starts to differentiate and form this unpigmented cell called blastema. And this blastema consists of different stem cells and progenitors. And as you can imagine, this, this, this unpigmented blastema has to form a brain because I have chopped off the new brain. Now, what happens is these progenitors has got the necessity to, to form all the neurons and the, and the brain and over day five and day seven, you see a complete and intact brain has been formed in the species. And by day 12, if I show you a regenerated um, animal and a wild type animal, which I've not amputated, there is literally no difference. It's basically a clone. Now, how, how small can you cut this form? So this is a, this is a work from you can bring from Dresden, Germany, uh, who runs a lab right there. They have chopped this very small animal. And I must say the size of these planarians, those who have not seen uh, these amazing uh, animals, they are roughly uh, less than a centimeter and sometimes a centimeter as well. So even those small worms, if you chop them into 16 different fragments, each of these 16 different fragments, as you know, has the potential to form 
uh, any uh, an entire organism uh, by day 14, all the 16 small, small fragments have formed to an individual um, animal system. And that led to a Scottish biologist in the 18th century to frame it and call it as an immortal under the age of the knife. And hence you can appreciate the name comes from the secrets of immortal worms. There are many, many novel secrets. I'll, I'll go on to some of it. Uh, it's not enough time to go to the vast knowledge of, of planarians that are present. So shown here is an in situ hybridization technique. And those who are not familiar with the technology, let me explain in a very layman. Here, we try to understand where a particular mRNA is expressed inside a cell. And here we use the gene called PB1. PB1 is highly expressed in the adult stem cells of these animals, which we call as neoblasts. And this PB1 gene, as you can see, is expressed all over the body, except two regions. One is the pharynx, which I said is the feeding organ, and the region, which is ahead of the brain. So you see the bilobed brain structure here that goes to the nerve cord, like any other flatworms, uh, see the nerve cord there. So if you cut this animal anywhere near the brain region or just the pharynx, they cannot regenerate into an entire organism. So that suggests that these stem cells, or rather the adult stem cells that are present in these animals, are the major player for planarian regeneration. Now, as I said, nothing in biology makes sense without the life of evolution. Why do these animals start to regenerate? Let me go back to the two different strains, how uh, planarians have evolved. Planarians have an asexual mode of reproduction and a sexual mode of reproduction. So what happens in a sexual mode is these animals start to pull their body apart. And then we don't know why they pull it and what's the key to, uh, to induce this uh, asexual mode of reproduction. And then these two individual fragments then, then form as a fishnet. And each of these fragments then again starts to form an entire animal. Whereas in a sexual worm, as you can uh, experience it, it should go to a circle of embryogenesis, similar to what I've shown in the first video in the first slide, where the two animals try to mate. And bear in mind, these flatworms are hermaphrodites, which means both the male and the female counterpart are present in the same animal. But uh, like many other animals where they can do self-fertilization, these animals need a cross-fertilization, which means Two animal species are required to mate. They form cocoons rather than egg. You can see in the culture gardens in this round black structure. And from this egg, the entire embryogenesis goes on and then it forms these hatchlings. And these hatchlings then starts to form these juveniles or the sexual organ starts to develop. And again, the circle of life goes on. And interestingly, the karyotype or rather the chromosomes of these organisms are very, very interesting because. They have eight chromosomes. And, and in a sexual strain, there is a Robertsonian translocation. As, as many of you know how Robertsonian translocation affects human body. It leads to failure to uh, divide a cell, several animalities, aneuploides, uh, Down syndrome is one of the major examples. But these animal species has got a Robertsonian translocation, but they are completely normal. Again, a cue. Anything that happens in an animal body, there is a cue many, many million years back in another animal uh, uh, world. And these Robertsonian translocation actually blocked them to undergo meiosis because there will be a non disjunction. And hence the evolution of a sexual reproduction. And hence it's an hypothesis that these animals got the uh, uh, cue to regenerate, which Eventually, many other species in the animal kingdom with the complexity of the organ has lost the capacity to regenerate. Now, there are several techniques uh, to see the, uh, the different structures of the animal. I'll not go into details of this today. But the next thing that I'll say is one of the tool and technology that is present in the planarians, which is RNAi. Those who are not familiar with what RNAi is, it stands for RNA interference. Now, how will you know a function of a gene into an animal? 
what we can do in cells or mammalian cells is you may have heard the term, term called small interfering RNA, siRNA, which actually blocks the transcription of, of mRNA. Now these animals, we make a double-stranded RNA and then we inject this double-stranded RNA into this body. What, what happens is this double-stranded RNA, when it goes inside a cell, it gets chopped into small, small, small parts. And then this individual small parts of RNA binds to your gene of interest, and then it blocks the transcription. And as you may know, the dogma of molecular biology, you have the DNA, from the DNA it forms, it transcribes to form a messenger RNA. The messenger RNA then translates to form a protein, and then it does its function. Now, if you want to block it, these small RNAs then blocks the transcription, hence the mRNA is not produced, and eventually the protein is not produced. Now, if we check, there's this the two phenomenal study uh, in planarians that gave us the knowledge that we can now utilize all these technologies to understand a function of a gene. And two interesting genes are the APC and the beta catenin. As you can see, I, I told in the beginning, if you cut an animal, it will form a head on the anterior side and the tail on the posterior side. But when you knock down beta catenin, which is a regulator of wind signaling, and wind signaling is required to form the tail. Now, the cell types don't have the wind signaling anymore. So the cell don't know that they have to form the tail. So instead of forming a tail on the posterior side, now these animals form a double head on the animals, in these animals. Similarly, APC, which, which also is an antagonist to wind signaling, which you don't need in the head region, but since we, APC is not there, instead of forming a head on the anterior side, it eventually forms a two-tailed phenotype. Now, many of their several species, you may have seen abnormalities showing this double-headed phenotypes. The understanding is it's all at the end of the wind signal. So you, may, you will appreciate how much of the signaling pathways that are conserved with humans are eventually conserved in several of these low invertebrates like Drosophila, C. elegans, and planarians is a new model organism for, for biomedical research. And the bottom part is uh, hypercephalized uh, planarians where the knockdown of beta can is so robust that instead of forming tails, they're just forming uh, heads all over the body. Now, you can utilize it to understand some of the tumor suppressor genes, like P53, as you know, it's a guardian of the genome. Uh, many of the human cancers uh, have got their P53 mutated. If you mutate P53 in these animals, you see there is that this is marked by uh, an antibody that marks all the mitotic cells. You see there is a burst of proliferation uh, after you knock down P53 in, this, in these animals. Same goes for P10, another tumor suppressor gene. And there's another paper from our lab, which is LPT, which is an epigenetic regulator. And this is what we call as an outgrowth in planarians, the tumorous structure that, that are present. So you see, in a normal animal, the, the epithelium is so smooth, but when you knock down this gene, it forms this outgrowth rather called the tumors uh, in, in, in these animals. And, and in many species, if you knock down some of the cell division uh, genes, like the condensin, which is called an NCAPG, I showed that they, these cells fail to uh, divide uh, and then the chromosome starts to fuse together. And that's a karyotype uh, of, of how the chromosome got fused in this animal. So you'd, you'd appreciate how, how many avenues we can study utilizing these novel organisms. Now, if you come back, how do you know these stem cells are pluripotent? In order to understand this, these stem cells were transplanted at a single cell level. You take a single stem cell, you put it into an animal where there is no stem cells. We kill the animals uh, by, by uh, lethal irradiation, which means there is no stem cells. And now you can start to see whether the stem cell that you have transplanted has the ability to, to divide. And, as, and, and that's how we proved that these stem cells are pluripotent in nature. And that's the dogma of the stem cells. It starts to differentiate, goes through several progenitors, and finally forms the neurons, the guts, and the epidermis. And like human beings, the complexity is much, much uh, like less, but they also have 
the guts, the neurons, the axons, the brain, uh, the kidney, not the kidney, uh, like the functional kidney like we have, but several of the ultrastructural similarities similar to a human being. And that brings to my second part of the talk is how we can utilize the concept of self-renewal and differentiation to something more interesting in the field of embryogenesis, bringing me to the concept of self-organization and self-assembly. And, uh, and I'll not be surprised if you have not heard these two terminologies because it's a, it's a very new concept. And I thought I'll give a glimpse of it before it comes into textbook knowledge uh, in the next uh, couple of years. Now, what is self-organization and self-assembly? You may have seen several of these examples in, 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 in nature, more or less every day. You may have seen a flock of birds moving around the sky in a collective fashion or a school of fish going in order to protect them from predation or in order to find uh, food or a group of ants bridging together to, to protect them for any other invasion or several of these patterns in sand that comes in a desert after there is a huge wind and there is no uh, anthropogenic cause. You see this series of self-assembly of sand giving rise to this beautiful pattern. Now, exactly similar thing happened in an embryonic stem cell. And that's led to the pioneering work by Yoshiki Shasai, a very celebrated Japanese scientist whom we lost a few years back, who first showed that you can make any organs in a laboratory using the concept of self-organization. Shown here is an embryonic stem cell where it self-organized and starts to form this retinal structure, rather the optic cup. And exactly similar, the, the, the proteins that are present in a human eye, the same protein structures and the cellular organization are retained in these artificial organs that recapitulate the human organs in a laboratory settings. Now we can now utilize the concept to understand embryogenesis. And if you remember my first slide where I showed that from a blastocyst, you get this inner cell mass, which is an embryonic stem cell. And these embryonic stem cells can form all these different cell types in the lab, which means in vitro in a culture dish. And if you don't isolate these stem cells, these embryonic stem cells eventually differentiate and finally forms a developing fetus, which means an embryo, and finally it forms an organ, an organ and an individual. Like for example, a mouse or a human being, more or less it's a conserved mechanism. Now this goes through a series of different stages, like it goes to a blastomia and then it's an AP blast. I'll not go into details of this terminology, but I want to go to is each of these uh, stages can be modeled in a laboratory settings in a two-dimensional cell, cell culture. And those who are familiar with the terminologies of two-dimensional cell line, like culturing cells or cell lines, like cancer cell, you may have heard um, um, some researchers doing uh, culturing cancer cell lines. They are not generating cancer. They are isolating the cancer cells from a tumor patient and then growing it in a laboratory setting. Similarly, Embryonic stem cells also we can culture in a laboratory settings, but in a two-dimensional way. Now, there are some ethical issues that has stopped this embryonic stem cell research in many countries, including the United States, because there is a group of people who consider that if we are taking the inner cell mass from the blastula, you are destroying an unborn child, which is ethically not right. Whereas in contrary, a counter argument belongs is a blastula is still not a child because until and unless it does go through an implantation, there is no chance to develop it into a baby. So we can use embryonic stem cell for research. Now, this is a very outstanding uh, controversy in the field of embryonic stem cells. And that inspired these developmental biologists to utilize them to model some of these key stages of embryogenesis in a laboratory settings. And as you know, the blastocyst, which are, consists of an inner cell mass, you can model the same blastocyst by mixing embryonic stem cells and trophoblast stem cells in a two-dimensional structure. And then you differentiate and form them in a three-dimension way uh, in a structure so that the cells will not stick to your culture plate, rather it will be floating 
and using the concept of self-organization, which I have explained before, now they can form a blastocyte. And people have shown uh, the, the groundbreaking work by Nicholas Rivron's lab from Austria, how these blastoids recapitulate an entire blastocyst. So to, to summarize the whole part, this is what I call it as an organogenesis in culture. Like similarly, all these stages that are present for embryogenesis from morula, blastula, gastula, and then forming the whole organogenesis to form the different organ structures to form an embryo. These organs can be recapitulated in a culture condition using a dish. And not only the embryogenesis, we can also form different organ structures in a laboratory condition, starting from human stem cells. And this is what we call as organoid, as you may be familiar with the uh, terminological OID, OID stands for something look-alike. So these are organ-like, and that's hence the term called organoid. And the reason why this started, and this brings me, when I was an undergraduate student uh, reading about stem cell research, uh, this, was a, this was a concept that stem cell research is a, is a recent breakthrough that will change our understanding. Uh, we can now differentiate the stem cells. We form all the neurons, the blood cells, the endoderm. We can culture, uh, we can test all these drugs, put it inside um, into a human being. We can cure several diseases. What has gone wrong? And this brings me well, how the three-dimensional structures have evolved because there was a massive loophole that, that were there in this two-dimensional stem cell research that inspired this modern day developmental biologist to take up on a three-dimensional approach. And partly because there are several studies uh, rather in the clinical trials of several drugs, cancer curing drugs or other disease curing drugs has been shown that any drugs that works in a two-dimensional cell line or even in an animal model, the same drug is not curing a patient. Why, why is that happening? Now you cannot cure you cannot, uh, you have identified a novel drug, you cannot inject it to a patient because there are several ethical rules. So you have no choice other than understanding its function and its effects in a two dimensional cell culture, which means dealing with all these cancer cell lines or even utilizing several of these animal models. Uh, mice being the most celebrated animal model for many decades, partly because we share a huge number of similarities with animal models. Nevertheless, several of these invertebrates like the Drosophila, C. elegans, and planarians, I have said, have also uh, expanded our understanding of several key biological phenomena. And I'll bring organoids here, which comes in between to this uh, two-dimensional cell culture and the three and the animal model. This three-dimensional cell culture comes in between, both in terms of simplicity and complexity and the different tools and technologies that are available. Now, as you may understand that there are several advantages of using organoids because major advantage is you are starting from a human stem cell or a human tissue. So you're not dealing with an artificial system like Drosophila, C. elegans, although they have significant similarity at the genomic and the transcriptomic level, the tissues are different. There may be some difference at the epigenetic level. And another uh, important advantage is we can propagate it for a long time, for many years, which was, which was challenging if we were doing mm, in, in any other uh, in vivo animal system like the Sophila or zebrafish. And like any model organisms, you have to appreciate that every animal system comes with the pros and accounts. Uh, not um, any, any model system is, is accurate. We have to choose a model organism based on the question based on what we want to answer using the different advantages that are present in this body. And I'll, I'll explain two examples of organoids, and they are two very new discoveries from Carl Kohler's lab from Harvard, uh, uh, who has generated a skin organoid from an embryonic stem cell. So what happens, you see, this is a confocal microscopy image of a skin organoid, and as you can see this bulging structure, most of you are very familiar with the coronavirus structure. Don't be amazed that this is a coronavirus, but it looks pretty much similar, like the spike proteins are present, but here, this five, these are not spike proteins, these are the hair follicles which are present under the skin, and they form these skin organoid structures 
from a human embryonic stem cells. Now, how do you know that these organoids are functionally viable? So in order to do this experiment, what they did, they transplanted the skin organoid under the skin of a nude mice. And those who are familiar with what a nude mice is, nude mice is a strain of mice that has a mutation that blocks them to form a, a, a hair follicle in their body. And that brings them a beautiful model. So uh, now you understand how uh, the research is going on to, to identify a model organism based on the question, because they have to identify a system where they can check whether these organoids are able to form the hair follicles. And what they did is they transplanted these organoids under the skin. And after 20 days, they see from these organoids, these human hairs have started to come up. What a cool system to model uh, an entire organ development in a dish and then functionally validate them. This is not limited to skin. Another beautiful technique that came in science a few weeks back is a, is a choroid plexus organoid. Brain organoids have been in the field for many years, uh, a pioneering work by Madeleine's lab from Cambridge. Uh, the choroid plexus, many of you know, is the region where the cerebrospinal fluid is present. And cerebrospinal fluid helps in the gaseous exchange with the blood-brain barrier that are present in the brain and the whole fluid is present all throughout the spinal cord. Now, starting from an embryonic stem cell, this group is now forming cerebral organ, which means exact brain. And now utilizing some of the growth factors, these brain organ, as you can see in this, in this image, starts to form the cyst-like structures, which we call as a choroid plexus organoid. And inside these cysts, they have got the cerebrospinal fluid expressing inside uh, in these organoids in a laboratory settings, not inside the human body. And to summarize the whole field of organoid is we can now model the entire human body and most of it can be modeled both from an adult stem cells and also from a pluripotent stem cells. Many of these organoids have been used from tumor samples as well. One of the major applications of, of organoids. Now, you, you may, any scientific discoveries takes immediate attention like whoever is now following the pandemic, uh, what I call as an infodemic, partly uh, because of the media attention that comes about all through the scientific discoveries. And when the skin organoids came, people started to think that, oh, wow, this is a new cure to baldness. And there's several uh, medias that have been um, covering this, this baldness, but my understanding is utilize these organoids for the fundamental understanding of how an organ develops. Definitely baldness can be cured at a certain distance, but there are several things that needs to be uh, taken care of before we can use this for functional uh, studies and regenerative therapy directly into humans. And this brings me again to what was the initial uh, promise of stem cell research to the recent hope, or is it still a hype of organoids and rather the stem cell research? Nevertheless, there may be lots of hype in the media that we can now use it to transplant any organs, but don't take this as a misconception that, okay, now we can generate all these organs like the cerebral organoids, someone having an Alzheimer's or Parkinson, we can transplant it to a new brain. That's not happening uh, soon. And let me very bluntly say that we can now use it to model certain diseases like neuro neurodegenerative diseases, necropsychiatric diseases, but if you ask me, can we transplant a cerebral organoid to a, someone whose brain is not working? No, it's not possible so far, but it has immense uh, potential to be used in regenerative medicine, toxicology, drug discovery, microbiology, gene editing, phylogenetic studies, and disease modeling. So that's a major application of these three-dimensional stem cell-based embryo models and organoids. Now, organoids are not limited only to, only to humans. And I will, uh, is the video coming here? Okay, I'll, I'll talk on another topic that beyond the human organoids, we can also utilize them for, for let me see the cursor, also use it for, for other 
uh, different animal studies. Like for example, the snake venom gland organet shown here is a confocal microgross of video where you can see there's organoids that are isolated from a snake venom gland and stained with a beta catenin which marks the epithelial cell layer. And as you go through the different slides of, of, uh, of these organoids in the microscope, you'd see how a lumen is formed inside, inside this organism. And this is where the major uh, venom is getting secreted from the epithelial cell types that are present uh, in, the, in this venom gland. Now, this has got immense uh, potential in many countries, including India, like we have, we still don't have a lot of, lot of um, uh, potential to uh, make antivenom because it requires uh, labor and, um, and experience to catch these poisonous snakes. Now, using, using the venom gland from these poisonous space, uh, snakes, we can isolate the organoids, we can expand them, we can extract the venom from these organoids in a laboratory setting and then form uh, antivenom out of it. Uh, and as you, you will appreciate how much uh, of work um, this has gone through to establish this model, uh, model for, for, for biomedical research. Now the question is, why do you think the venom that is uh, extracted from organoids in a, in a laboratory setting has a similar potential compared to a snake bite? And that's a very pertinent question to ask. And I'll show you how they have addressed this question. They, they cannot inject it, this venom to a, to a, to a human, human being because that's not ethical. So what they did is they cultured the mouse muscle cells and every, any muscle uh, type excitatory cell uh, shows, um, uh, shows uh, ex excitation and they, they, they show this calcium signal. So when they extracted these organoids and injected it uh, to this muscle cell in the control cell, you see the calcium signaling is very much accurate. Whereas when you put the venom gland a supernatant, they don't, they don't have any, uh, any calcium signaling very, very similar what happens in a human body when a venom gets uh, uh, entered into an animal system. So that functionally proves that organoids that have been formed in an in, in artificial in the laboratory setting has an exact same potential what happens inside, inside a human body. And my last slide uh, from this part is, is uh, nothing, uh, many people are now talking about COVID-19 and organoids have immensely helpful to understand the biology of the COVID-19. And shown here is an electron micrograph from COVID-19 patients um, that have been taken from um, a hospital in Washington, DC, where you can see the, how the coronavirus starts to replicate inside the epithelial uh, lining of the, of the intestine, the kidney, and all other different structures, the lung, etc. Similarly, when, when a group isolated the organoids from a human intestine and then artificially subjected them to, to coronavirus, they also see similarly what happens inside a patient, uh, the exact same thing happens inside the gut organoid, pretty much recapitulating what happened inside the body. Now you may imagine how much of it has a potential because we are still struggling to identify a potent vaccine, but we can come up with a therapeutic. Now, using these COVID-19 patients, we can store them in organoids, we can cryopreserve them, and now do a high throughput drug screening and identify which drug is utilizing and can be utilized uh, to, to see which, uh, which, uh, which uh, drug will be potent to combat the, this virus. That brings me to the summary of both the, both the section, and I hope um, I try to convince that some of these um, extraordinary research that can be done using this really amazing regenerative animals uh, can be utilized to understand how regenerative processes have been evolved in the animal kingdom. Many of these species have got this pluripotent adult stem cells that helps them to, to regenerate and PV uh, let's not make this misconception that PV is a gene that is helping them uh, to regenerate. PV is just like a germline in stem cells. It's a pi RNA component. It's present in human body as well, highly expressed in the germline stem cells like the sperm and the ovum. Uh, but just with the 
uh, sake of evolution, PV is highly expressed in the adult stem cells of, this, of these animals. Similarly, these organoids recapitulate the organ function, and we can understand how the embryogenesis can be modeled in a laboratory settings, can be used for high throughput drug screening, model the viral replication. I took an example of coronavirus here, uh, but nevertheless, it can be used for any other diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Zika virus, Ebola, have contributed immensely in the field of biomedical research. And another important study is they are amenable to genetic studies, which is what my interest is, and I work at NIH, working how the different point mutations of two tumor suppressor, the BRCA1 and the BRCA2, that are highly mutated in breast cancer patients. So I try to understand what are the effects of, of this different genetic variants uh, using these three-dimensional structures. But I've not gone in details. I think I'm running out of time uh, here. But my next part will be on how, um, and if you have any questions to the initial part, uh, I'll be happy to take some questions. But next few slides will be on the career guidance. Uh, I hope I have some time to show some um, video. Mm. Yes, yes. OK, OK, thank you. Okay. Dr. Shahu, will you take the question first or after the completion of your second session? I think let's let's finish it off and then we will okay. take both together. Okay, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll I'll go through. It makes I've I've really received a, a many emails and um, requests of like what it is actually to be in Oxford, and uh, it's a very partisan question. Uh, when I was a student, uh, it's something that uh, comes to my mind as well. Um, and thanks to the COVID-19, uh, and let's take it in a very positive way because these webinars are giving the opportunity uh, for us to explore who have gone through the whole process uh, and to, to share our experience. And mostly the students to get uh, a little experience of how it is to be, um, to be uh, staying and working in one of the um, elite universities in the world. And I'll, I'll, I borrowed a, a video from the University of Oxford to show this that makes my job a little bit easier. I'll keep it for you and then I'll talk later. Well, thank you for watching. And as I said, it's a life-changing experience. But before, before we, we talk about all the different avenues that are present in Oxford, the most important thing is 
what it is and how to apply to to universities and it's a, it's a it's a long procedure i'll not uh, have the time to explain in all details but i try to go through an overview and if you have any questions i'll share my my email uh, if, if you like and try to answer uh, some of your questions uh, with the time that we have with the organizers uh, but uh, feel free to email me if you have anything and more for the knowledge now, how to apply to um, to University of Oxford, and and this this video will will explain it uh, overview, and then I'll I'll go into some of the details which you will not see um, uh, from 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 outside, and only an insider experience can can explain it. Applying for graduate study at the University of Oxford. Want to apply to Oxford for graduate study? Great. Start thinking about your application early. Maybe not that early. First, choose a course. You can find one that fits your interests through department websites and www.graduate.ox.ac.uk slash courses. Check the course page on our website for entry requirements, applicable deadlines, and to make sure you qualify for entry. Some courses suggest you identify a potential supervisor at this stage, so check the course details now. A virtually unique feature of Oxford is that every graduate student is a member of a college, a small interdisciplinary community for living, working and meeting other scholars. When you fill out your application form, you have the option to express a preference for a particular college. If you'd rather not express a preference, you can let us choose a college for you, as one third of our applicants do. Regardless of what you choose to do, the success of your application will not be affected at all. Don't forget, if you want funding from one of the many University of Oxford scholarships, you'll need to apply by the relevant January deadline. If you're not sure what funding is available, you can use our online search tool at www.graduate.ox.ac.uk slash funding search. Applications will need reference letters, official transcripts and other supporting documents, so it's a good idea to think about these things early. Once you've decided who you wish to write your reference letters, Contact them before you start your application to let them know. Scan and upload your official transcripts. If you need to request one from a previous institution, make sure you request it in plenty of time, check how long it will take, and make sure you upload it by the deadline. If English is not your first language and you have your English language test results, include them in the application. If you don't have the results yet, you can still submit your application and send them in later. To find out more about our application form and to learn more about requirements, you should read our application guide at www.graduate.ox.ac.uk slash application guide. If you still have questions, there's no point in waiting. Get in touch with us. Check our Any Questions page at www.graduate.ox.ac.uk slash AQ or for academic inquiries, get in touch with your chosen department. Then you will truly be ready to make the best possible application. Good luck with your preparations. Applying for graduate study. Well, so that is what the whole uh, uh, platform of uh, applying to University of Oxford. And let me let me explain what uh, Oxford is. Oxford is not uh, a single university. Uh, it has got the individual departments, but uh, it consists of 38 colleges. And the 39th college is uh, starting from this year. Uh, which is which is remarkable be because it's one of the oldest university in the world um, that uh, relates to uh, the oldest college from 12th century and then even in the 21st century you see a new college uh, has is starting to develop so uh, don't imagine that uh, it's, it's an age-old university everything has been um, very old uh, we do have several modernized buildings as you can, so this was my college where I studied uh, during my PhD. I belong to Keeble. Uh, so that's the church of the uh, chapel and every college. I, the reason I kept this, this slide here is to give a uh, overview of what the collegiate system means. Uh, and those who are from, from India, the collegiate system is pretty much different than what it is in, in UK. And especially in Oxford, I think only Oxford and Cambridge have the collegiate system. Uh, every college has a church like uh, as you can imagine it's a, it's a christian uh, environment uh, every college has a college bar where most of the people uh, socialize and this is not only for drinking but also to do some of the brainstorming uh, ideas with some of the very intellectual people 
yeah. who worked there. And I remember during my uh, finishing years of my PhD, I used to spend most time here. That's the dining hall. And those who have watched Harry Potter, you may have uh, remember one of these dining hall because Harry Potter has been shot in one of these uh, colleges. And the fourth one is the library where uh, the researchers don't spend a lot of time unless you're from a social science or arts background. Uh, scientific researchers spend most of the time in the laboratory, which is uh, within a department. And there are many departments, and zoology is uh, a part of it, where I uh, did my PhD. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll skip this, uh, this video because it, I'm not running out of time. But now the question is how to uh, write a good application for, for, for Oxford, and not only for Oxford, uh, for any uh, universities abroad. And four important parts that I kept it here are actually highlighted is crafting your CV. Uh, this is very important because you will be judged based on your CV and uh, write it in a way so that it's not too lengthy or it's not too small. Uh, uh, it's a lengthy like sometimes we see CVs coming on like 10, 15 pages. I mean, they will uh, shortlist everything that we, that they do in a daily life. I mean, that is very bad. You should not write it. Uh, so cover only the key points um, and focus on what you have done. That is very important because uh, the major mistake that a lot of people do is they will say, oh, I have this, this, this. I worked in this lab. Um, I, uh, I was in that institute. I attended that seminar. None of these actually make sense unless you say what you have done in that lab. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you are in a Nobel laureate's lab, unless you say, okay, I did this part. This was my contribution during my research career there, summer training or whatever you want to do. Uh, another important seminar attendance, and I've seen uh, this, I was attending many uh, webinars in India, and I see many people ask for, uh, this feedback link and certificates and all. Let me put it in a very blunt way. And uh, none of these seminar attendants actually uh, will help you for your applications. It's good to enhance your knowledge, but this is not something that you should put in your CV. If you're if you're presenting, be it in a oral or or a poster in a in a conference, that is an advantage. So write that, but not if putting like 20, 30 seminar attendants actually backfires your application to you, suggesting that you don't know or how, to, how to propose a rather good way. Second important trait is how to email your, uh, to the graduate school. And this is very important. Proper salutation. Don't write like, hey, hello, uh, what's up? Those are not professional. Put it in a very professional way. And this is something important when you're applying to an UK university. Uh, we Indians have a tendency to write as respected sir, respected madam. Uh, don't keep it like that. This is, a, this is a different, you may find it as a culture shock, but uh, abroad or Western countries uh, go by their first name. You can write doctor something or professor something, but don't use this terminology, respected or sir. Sir in UK is taken as a very, uh, in a, in a very other way, as you may know, it's, it's something called with, with knighthood in the United Kingdom. Every email should contain a subject line, uh, a signature. Signature is important because that gives an uh, addition like what, how, who you are, but that does not mean you paste your whole CV inside it. And then your email, because that's the first impression because majority of the time, these PIs will not even open your CV unless they're impressed what you've written in the email. So that is very important. And then now the final part is whoever is, I, I guess this audience are mostly biologists, but don't think that you're doing a PhD in biology means you are dealing only with biology. You need chemistry, nearly daily life. You need mathematics, you need statistics. And as I said, all throughout the talk, think biology in the light of evolution. Otherwise you're doing a biggest mistake, uh, understanding the mysteries of biology. And the final part is no analysis makes sense without the statistical power. Now going through all these videos, I don't want to overwhelm you. I know it's all cool, it's really nice, but let me put you a fact, how much of the funding it requires to do, and I'll keep only Oxford, this was like three years back. Uh, it is increasing um, more or less every year and it will increase. It costs for three years at least more than 100,000 pounds, which in an Indian currency is above a crore. Uh, and that's a huge amount of money. Uh, and I would not recommend anyone, if you're not getting a full scholarship to go, 
uh, but getting a scholarship is, is different. There are several scholarships and not only for Oxford or Cambridge, there are other universities as well. You just have to keep trying. Rejections will be a part of the process, but you have to accept it and do it. But four things that I'll say what, what makes an Oxford application different is you should have an excellent academic record because you need to remember uh, all, your, uh, all the people who are um, coming, who are your competitors, your peers giving in the interview has an excellent academic record. So that, that just goes off because the two persons have exact same amount. Next comes is the leadership skills, is how much you have led. So that's why do something that is beyond your CV. Don't do things that, okay, this I'm writing for my CV. Things that makes you happy, uh, feels you like, oh, I should do it, uh, contribute to the society, do it. Motivation is very important because if you are not motivated, uh, it's, you're, you're just done. You cannot experience the interview of the Oxford School. Now, taking science as a career, I'd, I'd, this is not my thing, but I found uh, this piece from Jayant Gaukar, who was uh, in the NCBS Bangalore, has very bluntly written several points, and I think this is very true. And and I'll I'll say just just says one point, and though if you if you don't find this in this this article, just email me, I can send you. About this is online from his lab website. Uh, is you started attending seminars, you realize that you understand only five percent of what he said, which may be true today as well. But don't be disheartened. This happens to everyone. But feel free to ask questions because that's how. Um, uh, you will be um, uh, exposed to some of the new things. And at the end, passion is uh, the ultimate thing. And my last slide for today is what my very dear friend uh, Lucy did when, he, when she graduated from Oxford. And I found this is like very, very helpful to people who are starting PhD or even thinking about PhD is maintaining a health work balance. It's very difficult, I'm, I know. It's not, it's not uh, easy, uh, but you have to do it. And considering with the immense number of reports coming out with mental health and, um, and other things, this is important, but this is only you can take care. You may get help from other people, but at the end of the day, it's your life and you have to do it. Uh, third thing, the second thing is um, every small bits and pieces you have to write because PhD is a long, is a long process. It takes four years, five years, six years, sometimes 10 years, and there's no harm in it because, um, because uh, uh, sometimes uh, it does, with different circumstances, it can get delayed, uh, but do it until you enjoy it. If you don't enjoy it, it comes as a burden to you and you will not enjoy it. Third one is a best is a finished thesis. This is true for anything, be it a, a publication or it's a thesis, Write as many drafts as you can, but until and unless it's finished, it's, it's not the ultimate thing. And the final thing is attend department seminars. As I said, these online webinars are a huge um, uh, uh, advantage for many students and faculties. Even I uh, try to attend many of it uh, during this pandemic. And not only attend seminars that are happening in your college, or in India, this is the best time that you can attend um, several of the conferences that are happening virtually all over the world. And trust me, you will never get this uh, opportunity again in your lifetime because we don't, ex we don't want to have pandemic again, but take it as an advantage despite all this negativity that are going around the whole world. That brings me to the final slide. This was not a research talk. I'm not acknowledging the immense amount of work that was done by my colleagues or student, um, we mostly get in Oxford is to have the undergraduates uh, who is to come from different countries to work in the lab and have helped me in my projects, including several students who work currently. But to, to many teachers from my undergraduate and master's college who have helped me to uh, come to this point, but two, two uh, Indian scientists who, who gave me the platform when I didn't know anything was Professor Patishar Tirai from Isaac Kolkata and Shravanti from NCBS, where I actually first holded a pipette and a, an instrument that I use more or less 99% of the time. And now, and then Aziz from Oxford was my PhD mentor and I'm working with Sham currently. So that's my email ID. Feel free to email me uh, anytime uh, and I'll try to answer back uh, most of it. 
And to many people, as I said, research is not uh, done without a funding. To many people who have funded, and especially the Inspire from India during my undergraduate days, and Clarendon from and from Keeble from Oxford for supporting my PhD, and I'm currently funded by NIH. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope I've not uh, taken a long time. Happy to take some questions if you have, and uh, thank you for listening. Yeah, I can do it. Yeah, I can do it. No problem. Okay. Right. As I said, like um, the the stem cells are not present in the brain and the pharynx, and that's why if you cut that my the small region that is present above the brain you will not be able to, to, to regenerate. And that's why a pharynx by itself cannot give rise to, to an entire animal. Whereas if you have the stem cell and you've got it from the head region, the head region can eventually regenerate the pharynx again. But as you, as you have clearly said, they, they lack the PV stem cell, so they cannot regenerate. Any question? Well, Shonnabha, I'm not an um, uh, expert on coronavirus or transposable elements, and I don't think I have explained anything regarding it. So I'll exactly. I'll, I'll do that it's better. I not do that. Right. I mean, this I've explained briefly, but I I, I can explain it more. Uh, so you have a somatic cell, which is, uh, which is, for example, take a skin, skin fibroblast, and then you have these Yamanaka transcription factors, which comes from the Nobel laureate Shinya Yamanaka, who got Nobel Prize for the IPSCs, and then these Yamanaka factors are the pluripotency factors, which is uh, OSKM of four SOX two, and you you induce these uh, transcription factors in these uh, fibroblasts. And these transcription factors, as you can know, it, it has the ability to change the DNA configuration and the function. It starts to uh, make these uh, somatic stem cells, rather fibroblasts, to form more like an embry embryonic stem cell. Like, and that's, that's the whole concept of reprogramming a fibroblast to an IPSC. Uh, nice question. Uh, I'm not sure, but I guess I, I don't. I mean, why I'm saying I'm not sure is because I don't know if anyone has done it. Um, but I think certainly a possibility. But not now. As I said, uh, many of these uh, organoids and embryos that I said uh, are coming from are coming from uh, understanding that laboratory. Uh, in the laboratory condition. And hence, uh, we need to optimize several of these um, uh, techniques, and then only we can use them for regenerative therapy. Well, that's the concept of xenograft, where you may mm, have heard several of the monkey mm, organs or pig organs have been used uh, classically to 
to, tra to transplant in humans. One of the major limitation is, uh, is the whole, uh, host uh, rejection or the graft rejection of any transplantation studies. So rather, although it is possible to take stem cells from animals and grow organs in humans, rather, I hope I was, I've convinced you that with the concept of organoids, now you can use a human stem cells, for example, a patient stem cells where you want to transplant, it is their own cell type, grow the organ, and then, then transplant it. Rather, don't you think that's a much better uh, approach than taking it from an animals and then transplanting it to, to another human being? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of reports that, I mean, uh, it's a whole dilemma of uh, embryonic stem cells comes from uh, both from umbilical stem cells and also those are unfertilized, uh, unfertilized eggs. I mean, bear in mind the embryonic stem cells that are present that are used in the in the lab, they are not by killing a blastula. Although there are rules from different countries, so certainly umbilical stem cells can be used. But these ethical uh, controversies are very country specific. Uh, like in the United States, we do have some limitations, but in the United Kingdom, uh, there is no limitations. But uh, but in order to have a generalized overview, people have now come up with these three-dimensional embryo models. And I think that will stop these controversies and will be used uh, in future to understand uh, this biology of embryogenesis and organogenesis in future. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, she meant by the quoting. If she meant by how we culture uh, the stem cells, uh, how we culture the stem cells. The stem cells uh, generally like uh, a, a fibroblast. So how we culture embryonic stem cells is we have a irradiated mouse fibroblast, and I'm talking about mouse embryonic stem cells because that's what I work on. Uh, mouse embryonic fibroblast. Uh, have a gene that, that maintains the pluripotency of these embryonic stem cells. Because if you just grow them in a culture dish, as you may, as you know, that stem cells will differentiate spontaneously to other cell types. But we need to keep them, the stemness within the cell type to do the experiment. And that's why we grow them in a, in a fibroblast. And the fibroblasts are grown in, in, a, in a layer of gelatin because gelatin, uh, the, the fibroblasts like the gelatin. So these are irradiated, which means the fibroblast will not be divided but they are living. And that's how it gives the uh, platform for the embryonic stem cells to divide and proliferate and grow for a long period of time. Whereas when you grow them in an organoid, because you need a three-dimensional structure, and the way to give the three-dimensional structure is something called matrigel. Rather, it's an extracellular matrix that is isolated from a mouse sarcoma. So these are the two coding materials that are classically used uh, for stem cell growth and uh, and uh, organize. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Right, this is a good question, and um, many people think uh, like that because uh, we have so many species that do whole body regeneration. But if you remember the initial few slides I've shown, uh, it's partly because of the complexity. Uh, human organ structures are, as you can imagine, with the million years of evolution, uh, the, the organs have evolved with many, many com complexity, which was not there in, in these uh, invertebrate animals. And, big, and the only reason is the, is the simple structure and the organ structure that represent in, the, in these uh, novel invertebrates, uh, which we don't lack it in, in, in humans. Although we, do, we humans do regenerate to a certain extent, but not to a whole organ like what is present in other animals. But it's just because of the complexity, no other reason.
Well, the neurons were um, initially considered to be terminally differentiated, but there are increasing number of reports that even the terminally differentiated cells can divide to a certain extent uh, with the, uh, if, there is a, if there is a need. Now, this kind of regeneration gets reduced under several disease conditions. For example, um, for example, like in Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, it would have been much nicer if the neurons could, could, could divide. But there are several reports now that neurons can divide, including muscles also, which was initially thought to be, uh, thought to be uh, terminally differentiated. And the relation with the stem cell growth is these terminally differentiated cells, because of the epigenetic modification, and as I said, in order to divide, you need to be in the mitosis, because after it goes through differentiation platform, the cells are not in the cell cycle stage. So there, there is all this kinases, the cyclines. I mean, if you're familiar with the cell, cell division, you know that these, these genes are downregulated, and that's hence the reason why the terminally differentiated cells fail to divide again. Thank you, no problem. Thanks a lot. Have a pleasure having to be here.